in this video, one of the most remarkable failures of all motoring kind. It's the Renault Avon Time. Uh, that is a mixture of French Avon, before, and time, English, so before time. It really was before its time. Uh, too much time. And it's been joined in this car park, weirdly, by a Renault 4 van. So that's cool. Heritage nods and everything. So uh, let's dig in to why this particularly hubnutty car is um, such a disaster. So if you haven't seen it already, I'll cover the history of the relationship between Renault and Matra in my test of an Aspas. So you might want to go and have a peek at that now. But in short, Chrysler developed the original concept for the Aspas. Uh, Matra turned it into a production reality. Then Peugeot bought Chrysler, said no. And uh, Matra went to Renault and said, well, come on, someone's going to make it. And Renault went, yeah, we can see a future in that. And they were not wrong. And that led to a happy relationship. There were three generations of the Aspas built by Matra using Renault running gear. Uh, the, the formula was very successful, but Renault got greedy. Renault decided it wanted the fourth generation Aspas to be steel and it wanted to build the whole thing itself. And Matra said, well, what are we going to do? This apparently was the answer. The MPV coupe that no one asked for and no one really wanted. Uh, it's an extraordinary car and uh, a fascinating one. It, it's kind of like the Citroen SM. Uh, it's just weird, very, very French, very, very enormous, seemingly pointless, but also absolutely magical. So uh, let's take a look. I mean, the styling is just utterly bizarre. Very, very closely linked to the third generation of Spass, I think, more than the fourth. There's just random air vents all over the place. This one's covered in bird muck and tree sap because Hubnut. It was also covered 352,000 kilometers. And believe me, the gearbox is feeling that as we'll discover later. Some lovely alloys on it, 17 inch alloys. Uh, there's this mid section where you've got some of the largest doors ever fitted to a production car. And uh, some rare bits, that's actually metal. But the rest of this car is fiberglass because that was Mat Matra's speciality. Uh, it kind of made the Renault Espas almost weatherproof. Returning to the important business of the doors, they are huge and people realise that this would be a problem in car parks. But if I open the door to its widest setting, it doesn't actually come out too far. Uh, and that's because of this remarkable double hinge section going on here. Look at that. It costs a terrifying amount of money to develop that. Uh, and on a car that basically didn't sell because yeah a few people wanted a sleek coupe but isn't particularly sleek it's absolutely enormous it's massive i've currently got it in open air mode where the window goes back and all the windows drops it's a full pillarless coupe but is it a coupe because it's got a magana-esque backside uh with an actual tailgate there is actually a boot in here but it's not a very practical boot because it, it's very shallow there is actually room for a full-size spare wheel it's missing in this example down there there's also some random wiring and bulbs because french uh, i presume they weren't there from the factory but yeah it, it's not really a, a very practical car because the boot is really tiny the little handle here little pull down handle for with which you can close the boot so um yeah it, it's it's challenging in the styling department but unashamedly eye-catching uh, the attention this thing gets driving around we went and put petrol in it earlier and that proved a bit of a challenge people want to come up and say what on earth is it and they did repeat the trick this side this is also a double hinged door so uh, there's an awful lot of engineering in there we just don't really know why engines you could have a two liter turbo four which this is or a v6 nice creamy v6 and you can have an automatic with that so here we have the 2.0-litre Turbo 4, known in Renault parlance as the F4RT, which looks particularly bad written down. I did forget, you could also get in left-hand drive markets a 2.2-litre turbo diesel, which is best avoided because it likes to grenade. 3.0-litre V6 sounds absolutely beautiful, but uh, I believe a cam belt change is technically an engine-out job, so uh, not joyous to work on. It makes the 2.0-litre turbo really the hub nut car we've already driven a Velsatis some years ago with that engine i don't believe it's a particularly bad engine i think it's quite good good torque delivery 
So it, it produces 165 brake horsepower, which is enough for a top speed of about 120 something and 0 to 60 time just under 10 seconds. Kind of enough, really. Uh, you don't need more than that. This isn't a sports car. It really, really is not a sports car. Look at it. It's blooming enormous. It's huge. Well, now we can show off the doors once more. I think good access front and rear, although you've got to walk up all the way up to here to then get in. Uh, the lever on this example has seen better days. This seat no longer wants to tip. It's fine. It's just a bit because French, but also because 352,000 kilometers. Let's close the door. Don't get your fingers trapped in there. Notice it's quite a quirky layout in here. We've got heater controls are mounted here for some reason. Electric window switch is a bit more sensible. Standard Renault gauges. Uh, we've got a six speed gearbox, very tall gear lever. The radio comes with a remote control. Oh no, the bit of trim's falling apart. Oh no, oh no. It's all gone a bit French folks. It's fine, no one saw anything. Yeah, you get a remote control which apparently has led to some drivers getting in trouble because the police think you're holding a phone. But this is actually a remote control, although you're better off putting that in the back, really, because there is Renault's um, somewhere around here. There we go. Uh, typical column-mounted control. So that kind of gives you all you need, really. Uh, the stereo itself hides under here, and it's kind of built in. There's a GPS built in as well, which presumably isn't very up-to-date. Don't touch that. Leave that alone. Uh, there's hidden storage all over the place, so that's a nice big draw down there. There's one here as well, which sometimes wants to open. Uh, oh, that's where your sat-nav is. Okay, so you update your sat-nav there, and uh, that's where you put your CDs in as well. That's quite handy. Uh, is that a space? Maybe that's not. I have a feeling somewhere up here is. Oh, yes. There we go. And it's a privileged spec. And it's another deep cubby so that you can fit an entire ice scraper in there. So that's quite neat. I oh, quite like that. Uh, you've got a big display up ahead for putting ignition on. You might actually be able to see some things. So that's the speedometer up ahead. Look at that, 345,000 kilometers. It's off and okay. So don't worry folks. So uh, yeah, uh, buttons up here for the roof and there's a big blind as well. Um, I've got the roof open mostly because uh, the air conditioning doesn't work, because hub nut. Uh, down here, I think there would be a cubby, but it seems to have been screwed shut. But I think this is also a cubby. Yeah, well, you can get a full cup of coffee in there, apparently. And uh, this moves around of its own accord most of the time. You keep catching it. That's great. Lovely bit of design. Uh, the uh, mirror control is down there, but uh, we've got other switches down here for dash brightness. And uh, there's a few scattered down here for things like indicators. Very, very electronic. Um, uh, yeah, I don't speak Dutch, but um, okay. Is that how you say okay? Maybe that's not how you press okay. I don't know how to tell it okay. What if it now thinks I'm not okay? But yeah, I mean, there's plenty of space up here. It's a nice, comfortable driving position. I've got somewhere to rest my clutch foot compared to that Mark 1 Aspas. The wheel arch intrusion is a little less. There's still a bit of it going on but it is far better, but it's the same commanding driving experience. It's why people buy SUVs, because they want this commanding driving position. This car has that at least, so that's not too bad. Let's go and check out the rear. So I've come to the other side, because I'm told uh, this is a better idea. So we'll um, open the door. Now we'll fold the seat. We just pull that handle and it does indeed tip and slide forward. That's convenient. And I'll hop in. Let's go all the way over and I'll hop in behind the driver's seat, where the problem is that the seats are so close to the floor, I can barely get my sandals underneath them. So saying there's plenty of leg room, but uh, that makes it rather uncomfortable. So you've got all this space, all this car, and it's not actually very comfortable to sit in the back of it, even though I've got an armrest and a glass panel in the roof. Currently two glass panels because the front panel has slid in over the top. This one, I don't believe moves. I believe this is a fixed panel, but I have got a blind here if it all somehow gets a bit too much. Jeepers. <laughs> Old cars are fun, folks. So getting out is an interesting experience because um, you can kind of just step out like this. I believe originally uh, it was designed so that window would drop automatically when you were getting into the back. I don't think this one does that. It might be broken or maybe that was just a myth. 
But uh, yeah, it, it's certainly a very interesting car. Now, where are my manners? I haven't done a windscreen wiper test yet. Let's um, start the engine. Yep, so far so uninspiring. By the way, there's a rev counter there. The bulbs are mostly broken, but... It's not quite as cool as a GSA rotating drum dial. You probably can't even see it. I'm struggling to see it myself. Uh, so there we are. But uh, windscreen washers, they are on the arm. Look at that. So you haven't got water spraying all over the place. They do a terrible job. But uh, I think maybe one of them's clogged. But we have got a triangle of doom going on right here. And that can cause the dribble of disappointment. But I just noticed, I can see the wires in that. That's a heated windscreen. Wow, I don't think Ford didn't let anyone else use that. Maybe they didn't tell Ford. Shh. Well, I think a little disappointingly for you, I'm going to have to put you there. But you, you can see how weird the driving position is. It feels so massively open. Although what you can't see is the fact there's an enormous windscreen right in front of me. But yeah, it feels very much like the uh, Mark 1 Renault Espace I was driving. It still feels like Matra's baby. And I suppose that is not very surprising. It kind of was. But I can imagine Matra going, okay, Renault, but are you sure this is going to be a good idea? And Renault going, oh, yes, yes, it'll be a really good idea. People will buy loads of them. People bought less than 8,000 of them. So that in um, modern car production terms is absolutely hopeless. So we're going to have a fair bit of wind noise going on with all these windows open because the aircon doesn't work and I don't want to die. This is the situation we find ourselves in. Here comes the speed hump. Woohoo! Floats over it like you'd expect a French car to float. So very, very comfortable, very, very relaxing to drive because that engine has actually got a decent amount of torque. It's um, fairly low down in the, in the rev range. So it, it's not a stressful car to drive. The engine suits the character of the car really rather well. A lot of people obsess about the V6s, but uh, yeah, the V6s aren't the be-all and end-all. Yes, they make nice noises, but they're an absolute pain to look after and uh, obviously drink a lot more fuel. Just really open her up. Now I've changed my mind. I don't want to open her up. It doesn't sound very good. There's just absolutely no point giving this car the beans. But, uh, I mean, if ever there was a Grand Tourer, this is surely it. The good thing about having the windows open is that when I put her into sixth gear, you can't hear the horrible gnashing um, metal sounds that the gearbox is emitting. I don't think it's very healthy, and fifth and sixth are very, very loud. In fact, when I first picked the car up, I made the owner pull over, and I said, I think this is broken. And then he took it for a drive and went, Oh no, it's been doing that for years. But I think at 352,000 uh, kilometers, maybe that's not too bad. That's an awful lot of miles. That's over 200,000 miles. Change to fourth now for a bit more serenity. And uh, yeah, it's just really, really nice. Sorry, you can now hear a moped driving along next to me on a cycle path. That's not the car. So the Avon team was launched in 2001, but by 2003, it was all over. And that was the end of Matra, absolutely tragically. I mean, it wasn't helped by the car being conceptually flawed into, you know, did anyone do any market research and see if anyone actually wanted this? But also Renault launched their own luxury car, the Velsatis. Uh, another quirky, very odd, big car. So, uh, and a lot more practical than the Avon time. So perhaps it's not surprising that people would rather buy one of those instead. Of course they, didn't buy very many of those either because it's a big French car but still it's holding considerably more numbers than the Avon time. I will say the way this car garners attention today is um, mightily impressive. It um, confuses a lot of people. Uh, it's just so so ridiculously different and for that I have to admire it. Now, they came, became collectible fairly quickly because the production numbers were so low. And uh, I've known a, a friend of mine sold his to a Frenchman. It was just like, I don't care, it's right-hand drive. It's a lot cheaper than they are back home. And uh, that collector interest has started growing. But uh, perhaps this is a, a lower-valued version because it's done a lot of miles and is not in perfect condition. Some of the trim, in particular, is distinctly French, i.e. broken. 
But the fact remains that an Avon Time makes um, a very, very practical classic. Probably why Danny Hopkins of Practical Classics, the editor no less, did have an Avon Time for a time. That's a difficult thing to say. So there's your driver's view and yeah, the, the front bumper is lost somewhere up front. We've no idea where it is. But uh, lovely commanding driving position. Really, really just very, very nice. I will say I have a slight issue with leather seats. Uh, I'm just not a fan of leather seats. Uh, I'm, I'm presuming you could get a Renault Avon time with um, Velour, surely. Surely Velour. That would be the one for me. This is the privilege, privilege top spec. I mean, I, I absolutely love it. I think this is uh, a great car. It's um, really, really pleasant to drive. You've got that commanding driving position. It's very, very comfortable. The ride is superb, uh, so I, I like it a lot. And uh, I find it a little troubling to say that because I know Miss Hubnut wants one as well. But uh, sadly, like I say, collector interest has always been there and it has started pushing those values up. But this is worth doing because again, I got seduced into the idea that the only way to do it was with the V6 engine and it just isn't. You don't need the V6, this is engine enough. It pulls so well, you can just leave it in a tall gear and just, oh, love it. But I have to say, for the mileage it's done, this car is in um, remarkable condition. 345,000, I may have said 352 earlier, but it's still quite a lot of kilometers. I would definitely rather have one of these than a Velsatis. Which may upset the um, Velsatis folk, but that's how I feel on the matter. I'm going to do a bit of highway driving, which is going to be very noisy, but I might use my one press button to pull all the windows and roof shut. And we'll see what a difference it makes once we're at cruising speed. Although the cruising speed in the Netherlands at the moment is only 100 kilometers an hour, 62 miles an hour. It's my first chance to really give it a beans. Yeah! Gets a shift on. Now, what I, w I will say that the, the issue is, it does that rev hangy thing that modern engines tend to do. Uh, I, I think for emissions reasons, uh, it's quite irritating. Yeah, it's, it doesn't roll around too much for such a big car. Handling is kind of what you'd expect, really, of a modern. They're all much of a muchness these days, aren't they? And uh, frankly, a bit too soon, we are at the speed limit, so let's shut everything. At one press, everything closes. Oh, magnifique. Now it is much quieter. Yeah, that makes a, a big difference. And uh, the dynamics in here, it's now become quite echoey just because there is so much glass around here. So it's a sign of how well damp the rest of the sound is, but you can't hear very much. If you strain your ears, you might just hear the sound of a gearbox torturing itself. Yeah, this is nice, but I'm starting to cook. There we go. Now it's just everyone else's tire noise. That's the problem. Oh. That's unpleasant. If you have just the roof open and not the windows, it's horrifically noisy. Lovely car for checking your blind spot though. It's lovely and it, it feels like an experience and that's what you want. Even if the target audience for this car is somewhat hard to decipher, that audience definitely wanted a car that stands out and uh, they've got that here. But it doesn't stand out and be completely hopeless. I mean, there's family transport. It's a bit rubbish because the boot is tiny. I'm trying to imagine me and my little family going on holiday in it. And uh, yeah, there just would not be enough space. We'd be far better off with an actual espas. So uh, yeah, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, it is very, very likable. So that was the magnificent white elephant. But it's the Renault Avon time. It's um, undeniably special and I'm very glad it exists, even though it must have cost Renault an awful lot of money and it cost Matra its entire existence. Yet somehow it feels worth it just because, wow, I mean, 
Mattress time was going to end at some point, wasn't it? It might as well be with something truly magical. It, it's a rubbish car, really. It, it, it's not anywhere near as practical as it should be for its enormous size, but I still love it. And uh, yeah, it definitely stands as one of the finest unnecessary pieces of French engineering out there. And they know a thing or two about unnecessary engineering. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Thank you very much for watching. Um, don't forget you can head to the Hubnut store and buy a lovely merchandise if you wish. Support options in the description below. Otherwise, we shall see you in a future video. Farewell. Dead ass. Hi. Private road, people, private road.